Hello world, good morning and happy Tuesday. I'm Allie with The Right Place, Right Time, award-winning author, international book coach and ghostwriter, and the host of Open Book Broadcast, where we talk about anything and everything, books and publishing and all the things in between, and we are an open book about it. Um, I am super pumped to have today's guest with us, Elena Joy Thurston. Welcome, Elena. Hello, so excited to be here. And I'm so pumped about today's topic. We're going to be talking about supporting and promoting LGBTQIA authors and all of the things that have to do with that, as well as hearing about Elena's fabulous story um, and some of the really important work that she's doing out there in the world. So let me introduce her properly um, before we dive into our conversation. So Elena Joy Thurston, featured in the award-winning documentary Conversion, Elena Joy Thurston is an inspirational diversity and allyship speaker, trainer, and author through a lens of LGBTQ plus inclusion. Elena Joy inspires her audiences to learn how inclusive leadership can improve company morale and productivity, changing members' lives in a practical way. A Mormon mom of four who lost her marriage, her church, and her community when she came out as a lesbian, her viral TEDx talk on surviving conversion therapy has been viewed more than 45,000 times and landed her media and speaking opportunities with ABC, CBS, Inbound, Penn State, Peloton, Michaels, and more. All right, Lena, <laughs> let's dive in, shall we? Let's, let's. Okay, <laughs> all right, awesome. So um, I would love to know who is Elena Joy Thurston, like when she's not in front of the camera and she's not in front of, you know, an office, like who are you when you get to leave the office behind, shut the door and come home and like get into your like pajamas. Like who's that person? <laughs> the biggest nerd ever. <laughs> I love it. How do you define nerd? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so I like puzzles and I like video gaming and <laughs> Oh my gosh, I, love it. Yes. I am very lucky that I have a career that I really love. Um, and it is because there's so many different facets of it. I'm the, I'm the volunteer executive director of a nonprofit whose mission is to prevent suicide and homelessness in our LGBTQ plus community. Like that work in and of itself is just soul giving to me and I love it. And then I'm also an HR consultant. And my specialty is that I work with executives who struggle with the intersection of personal belief and best practices as far as diversity, equity, and inclusion. So because I have that Mormon background, I'm able to walk into these boardrooms and and have that conversation without anyone feeling defensive or attacked. They're not feeling judged because I can't judge them because I was them for so very long, right? So both aspects of my work, I love, and I'm definitely one of those people that I can't just do the same thing over and over again. So when my kids aren't here, I am definitely doing 12, 14 hour days in the office and I'm okay with that. I really love it, I do. But yes, my girlfriend and I like to do puzzles together as well as there's a video game that my kids have loved for a long time. I've got four kiddos. All four of them play this one video game. So last summer, I believe, no, it was the summer before, I decided I was going to learn this video game because you play in teams and there was one more spot. There were the four kids and there was another spot. And so I was like, I'm going to learn how to play this. And now I'm a little obsessed. And now it's kind of the thing I have to do every day before I can relax. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I have yet to learn The Legends of Zelda, which my oh my, um, my husband and my son love to play together. And it's like a really nice bonding thing for stepdad and kiddo. Um, but I'm like on the side, like it looks like it would be interesting, but I'm kind of terrified of the joystick. Like I, like I, I never really elevated that well from like the Super Nintendo uh -huh. left. Uh, you know, controller to the yeah. one with like, multiple buttons and like rolly things. I'm like, oh, I, yeah. don't, I don't even understand. Like, you know, some <laughs> people are all left feet. I'm like all thumbs. Like, I don't have any any understanding of how those things work. I love that. I love that. So it's a family thing, but it's also kind just like a like a, a guilty pleasure kind of thing. Oh yeah, <laughs> big time. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. Um, all right. So why don't you, you, you've touched on a few elements of your story. Why don't you just give us the cliff notes? Because there's, there's pieces of it in your bio. You were once Mormon, you've got four kids, you're now out. 
Um, you were in a documentary called Conversion, which I know what that means, but others might not. So give us just like the Cliff Notes version of your own kind of, um, you know, life's critical moments. <laughs> you got it. You got it. I'll do my best. Let's see. I was a devout member of the Mormon church and got married in the Mormon temple to my husband when I was 20 years old. By the time I was 30, I had four kiddos. By the time I was 37, I had enough space in my brain finally to realize I didn't like my life, but that wasn't possible because I had the dream life, like literally the white picket fence, big trees in the yard, baking bread every week. Like that was literally the life and that was supposed to make me happy. So the fact that I wasn't happy and I had attained that life was very scary. And I kept trying to distract myself in a lot of different ways, but it basically came down to the fact that it became undeniable one day that I was not attracted to men and I was completely in love with my best friend. And that was not an option because I had worked my entire life to be able to earn my way into heaven where I could be with my kids for eternity. And if I pursued these feelings and did not continue denying them, then there was no way I was going to achieve heaven and eternity with my kids. So I found a guy in town who said he could fix that. He had been doing this for 40 years and said, you know, there's something in your background, your childhood probably that traumatized you and made you think that you are unsafe around men and that you are attracted to women. And if we heal that trauma, then you won't feel that way anymore and you'll be attracted to your husband again. And so that sounded logical. And I signed right up, not realizing that this is conversion therapy, which is banned in about half the states for minors. And that's because 57% of participants, both minors and adults, become suicidal. And after six months of treatment, that's exactly where I was. And I am very, very lucky and hashtag blessed, you could say, that I ended up in emergency services with real doctors. And they put me on real medication for the first time in my life. And I was able to really connect some dots and realize a lot of women have been assaulted at some point in their lives. And that does not mean that they are attracted to women. Like that's not a correlation. I had been lied to. And that was really hard to wrap my brain around. And yet it be it allowed a path for healing to open up. And I decided at that point it was better for my kids to have a gay mom than a dead mom. And I needed to stay and I needed to do whatever it took to stay. And that meant coming out to myself, to them, to the world, to the church. Uh, it meant moving out for the first time since I was 20. At this point, I was 38 years old. It meant filing for divorce, which then necessitated, I got to have a career. I had been a stay-at-home mom since I was young, <laughs> very young, and I didn't have really have any assets. I had, But bigger than that, I didn't even know who I was. Like all of a sudden, my entire concept of self had been obliterated. And yet that doesn't stop the bills from coming, right? You still got to pay those. You still got to pay the bills. You still got to put food on the table. So I developed this pretty intense self-awareness system that I used to get to know myself as an adult for the first time. And I didn't know any queer people at the time. Like literally, I only knew ex-Mormons. I knew Mormons and I knew ex-Mormons. And it turns out a whole lot of us are living a life full of consequences of our lack of self-awareness, our lack of knowing really who we are and our impact on those around us. So I started teaching my system to them. It proved to be helpful. I did the TED Talk. It went a little bit viral. And then COVID <laughs> happened and my speaking career went face down in the couch, like pretty much everyone who had in-person events. And that's, it was no better time to start Pride and Joy Foundation, the nonprofit. We really needed to reach these parents who their kids were stuck at home with them and they were not figuring out how to communicate. They weren't figuring out how to support one another. There was, they needed a lot of help. And it, it especially right then, right? We were all trapped and we were all scared. And all of a sudden these kids are feeling like I don't, I, I have no way out and I don't know how to communicate with my mom and dad. So that was really, really good. And then we started getting a lot of requests for training. And so that's when our board decided, let 
uh, Elena is going to go take the HR stuff and, and spin that off. We, we really want to focus on amplifying queer voices and supporting parents of queer youth. And so that's what the foundation does. And then I have my consulting as well. So whew, I hope that was a good summary. <laughs> oh my gosh, so many delicious things in that. And, and also vulnerable and painful and hard things. Like I can't even, I mean, and this doesn't compare, but like, you know, in 2017, I went through uh, my second pregnancy and it ended in miscarriage. My, mm. my um, marriage ended, uh, you know, my job bottomed out. I mm. like felt like, and I was like 30 something. And I felt like it was a, uh, it was a complete reconstruction. And yet in listening to your story, I'm thinking, but man, I kind of knew who I was. I had support, like I had a job that was paying bills, even though like the promised promotion had gone away, you know, like I had, I had footholds. And you, you, you went out, like, I think of you going out into like a desert, like, and you're by yourself. I mean, and you're like, I got to make water out of the sand and I've got to like, you know, I've got to walk however many miles to find people who are like me. And I've got to like deal with like the sun beating down on me, you know, and coming from every direction. Like, you know, that's the image I, I got of you as you were, you were saying that, that, I mean, it was a total, like, you know, flip of all things. Right. I mean, religion, family, identity, um, career. I mean, boom, boom, boom. I mean, and these are not, these are not light things. I mean, these are huge things. Um, so, you know, do you feel that when that you were going through that, did it help to tell your story? If you found mm. the right people to say it to? Absolutely. I mean, and that began from like the very start, the very minute I was able to say to myself, Elena, I think, I think you're gay. And from that moment, like those are just inner words, right? But that it, I felt literally more alive. I felt literally more connected to the earth. And so I started saying it more and more often. And then I started saying it to those around me, y'all, I think I'm gay. Can you believe, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And every single time I felt more here. And so again, going back to that, my only goal was to stay for my kids. I felt more connected. And so I pursued that more. And that's every time I used my voice, whether it was just with myself, using my authentic voice and realizing, okay, that's me. That's mm -hmm. what I sound like, not Sister Thurston, the role that I played for 17 years. That's Elena Joy. That's me. And yeah. that was an incredible discovery process. And I couldn't have done it without paying attention to my voice. And then I have just found like every single time that I can share it, I not only get more healing, but have a greater, deeper sense of who I am. And I think that to me is the biggest joy in the world. I lost so many years not knowing who I am and not being able to connect with my real self. And so now every time I figure out a way to do that, I figure out a new hack or a new habit, it feels so good. Yes, yeah. my voice is absolutely critical in my healing. There's no doubt. And have you found that as you've become more empowered by sharing your story and you do it more frequently, that people come forward in relation, like they resonate with your story, so therefore it inspires them to come out and say the words that they need to say, you know, you're doing a lot of work here. You're like between the nonprofit and the consulting and the, like, you must be seeing this happen in all kinds of different ways. Absolutely. Two weeks ago, I was speaking at a conference in Denver and I share my story and I tie it to why we need inclusive leadership in the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. I do my job. Right. And at the end, a person came up to me and this happens so often. I need people to understand this because I think they feel so solitary, isolated, alone in this experience. But it happens one out of every three times I present, which is this person coming up and saying, my parents sent me to conversion therapy. I didn't realize that. I didn't know that that could be one of the reasons I've been struggling so much. Wow because it was so normalized. It can be so normalized, especially if you're not in a position of power, if you're a teenager or a young person, depending on adults for resources, you know, they don't say, hey, by the way, I'm sending you to conversion therapy that's banned in half the states, completely banned in Canada and Germany, but I'm doing that, right? So you might need therapy later on. <laughs> like 
that's not done. And so it's hearing my story and hearing my definition of it. And frankly, I think there's a power for a lot of people in hearing that a mom went through it. Because I think so many people went through it as teenagers, as young adults, not in a position of power, that it feels like uh, I'm such a victim and I'm really like, maybe this was the right way. Like my mom and dad, I know they loved me. And so maybe they, maybe this was the path I was supposed to be on. But then to hear like, no, a mom got duped as well like a mom with a college education and in the upper middle class tax bracket got duped as well. Like this, there's something really validating about that. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, this is why I think that the power of stories is just so incredible because it's not just seeing our own experience in somebody else's, but it's also learning things about ourselves that we had no idea. Like yeah. um, self-awareness is also built out of that. It's not just looking at that person and being like, oh yeah, like there's so much of what they went through that I went through. It's also like the light bulb moments of mm -hmm. like, so that's what it's called. Or like, I now can name it because I have words for it and I didn't have words for it before. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else gave me the words, which, you know, empowered my voice to actually say something out loud instead of just having like all of the inner dialogue that we often, that we often have. Um, so I put, I put the, uh, the award-winning documentary conversion just to re remind people. And I put, um, the website to that, uh, movie in the chat or in the comments. Um, so hopefully people can see that. And if they can't, I will go back and I'll update this after the fact. Um, so Elena, let's talk a little bit about then the work of the, the nonprofit, um, and raising the voices of queer authors. So what mm -hmm. kind of work are you are you doing there? And I know that you've got a really cool program on a publishing class um, coming out um, for queer authors. So why don't we talk a little bit about those two things? Yeah, so we really quickly realized that we needed to elevate and amplify the voices of LGBTQ plus people because there, there are so many parents out there, which is the other side of what we do. There are so many parents that you know, they look at what is the future of my LGBTQ plus kid. And if they haven't allowed themselves to be exposed to the community very much, they're going to have very few icons to look at. It's either going to be Ellen or RuPaul, right? And that's not the future of every queer child. But if we haven't been exposed to other options, we don't know that. And so we wanted to elevate and amplify the voices of LGBTQ plus subject matter experts in a really intentional way to expose them to these parents of queer youth that are wondering what is the future of my child going to be like, right? We can show them really successful, incredible queer adults. And then we realized, okay, we've, we have so many queer subject matter experts out there that have no idea how needed their voices are. And then you combine that with all the barriers to being able to get a platform, whether that's a stage with a microphone or a published book. And so we developed these two different courses. Keynote Queers is our public speaking course and its sister course is Outright Authors. And that's what we have coming up that we're so excited about. It's an eight week course, Path to Publishing, only for queer authors of nonfiction. There are a lot of public, there are a few, there's enough. There's enough publishers out there for LGBTQ plus fiction. And I love all of them. I love that I discovered them as like a 40 something year old. And now I read all the queer YA I can possibly get my hands on. <laughs> it's fabulous. But what we, what we wanted to focus on was those nonfiction books, those leadership books, the business books, basically the subject matter expert books. You know, there are things that the world needs to hear. Like, how do we navigate a queer divorce? Like, no one's written that book. How do we navigate finances when we don't inherit generational wealth? Like, that doesn't come to our side of the family most of the time, right? And lots of times our parents and our families have completely cut us off. So we don't have that backup financial system. How do we navigate that, right? Like there's so much out there that our community and the world at large needs to understand. So how do we break down those barriers? 97% of the publishing world is straight. 85% of it is white. So what can we do to break down those barriers? And so Outright Authors was our way of trying to achieving that. I love it. It's a great title. It's a great mission. Um, so 
one of the questions, as I told you, you know, in the studio here before we went live that I came up with this morning was, you know, how do our LGBTQIA folks find publishers who are either also identify um, within that community and maybe that's who they want to work with? I know I've, I've experienced that with clients, you know, they want to, they like me very much, but they want to work with somebody who identifies in a similar way that they do because they feel like there will be a greater ability to understand them, um, mm -hmm. which makes a lot of sense, right? Because we're looking through our own lens of identity and how we show up in the world. Um, mm -hmm. So either how do our LGBTQIA authors find other LGBTQIA authors <laughs> or publishing professionals, or um, how do they find safe ones? How do they find the the allied publishing professionals who are there and ready to support them? What are some suggestions? It absolutely comes down to word of mouth. Um, just like in a lot of different things, I think a lot of aspiring authors know that they find the authors that they want their books to be on the bookshelf with, right? And then they go and look at who did they use to publish? Who did they use to do the final edit? Who did they use to do the developmental edit? I mean, that's why all the acknowledgements and thank you sections are in these books so that we can learn from each other. Who did you trust? Because I got to figure out who I'm going to trust, right? So I think anyone from a marginalized population is probably doing that. I do. And then it goes out to like word of mouth also being social media. Like that has how, is how I found one of my favorite publishers. They publish... BIPOC and LGBTQ plus voices. And I have found every single book they've put out, I have found value in. So now I have a favorite publisher of all things. And from there, I'm probably going to scour their acknowledgement sections to find all of those different professionals that they use. Um, and then it comes down to like talking on LinkedIn and other networking type forums, like who did you use? Who was a good experience? You know, just because someone identifies within the community doesn't mean they're good at copy editing, right? Like it's yeah. it's right. a starting point, but it's definitely not a final decision. And if you can find an ally that you feel incredibly comfortable around and you feel like will understand the nuance of the experience that you're writing about, then finding an allied copy editor who has great skills, I mean, I think everyone's down for that. So it really does come down to word of mouth it, because it's a trust thing. We have so much at stake. We can't assume that you're an ally, even if you tell us you're an ally, right? Like, yes, it's really helpful to have the progress flag somewhere on your website, right? When I'm checking you out, like that will make a big difference. That will mean that I will reach out to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's going to be a few other questions that I'm going to ask to see if you really get the nuance of my experience. Yeah. yeah. What about like, is it helpful? Because again, I'm thinking I totally agree. Just because you said that you're an ally doesn't actually mean that you are one in action. Um, and it can be a big lip service and then, you know, people can walk into the wrong places with the wrong expectation. Um, do you think it's helpful for those publishing professionals who want to engage and bring those voices to them um, to not, I mean, I like the suggestion of having the, the flag available and visible on like your website. Um, is it helpful to have diversity and inclusivity statements like available on their website as like with their stances to be looking mm -hmm. at their LinkedIn profiles to see what kinds of things they're talking about, promoting and mm -hmm. sharing, you know? Y yes. Yeah. I, I hesitate for diversity statements, but I think an authentic vision of who you are and where you want your company to go, mm -hmm. that says a lot, right? There are very simple statements that say a lot. Things like, I believe trans women are women. Mm -hmm. That yep. says a lot, right? And I believe Black women should be paid just as much, if not more, as a white cis man. Yep, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. those things, those things will say a lot. Also, if you happen to have something, I've seen this before, like if you have something on your website with the logo of a charity that you support, that you advocate for, right? And that's also going to say a lot, like that's where you're putting your time and your energy, That depending on what nonprofit you're picking, like that's going to say a lot, right? So yes, I think there are definitely signifiers, but they have to be 100% authentic. People yeah. from marginalized populations can definitely see performative allyship a mile away. It's like gaydar, only stronger. <laughs> so <laughs> like, it doesn't matter what you do or say, as long as yeah. it's 100% authentic. Yeah. 
uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and for folks who catch this replay, if you're not familiar with performative allyship, it's saying some shit, but not meaning any of it. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's my going to be my clip notes version of how to define that. I'm sure we can have a whole other separate conversation yeah. just about that. Um, all right. So what about, you know, I, I totally believe in the power of sharing your personal story. And you've also spoken to that here this morning. But, you know, tell us a little bit about kind of a balanced perspective on marginalized or silenced voices being heard. What are some of the, the benefits, but also what are some of the costs? Mm. Let's just start with the cons. Let's just like go right there. Um, the con is there's an emotional labor to it. There's an emotional labor to being visible in life. And then you up the ante by uh, being extra visible with a publication or being on a stage with a microphone. And, and like you say in your forthcoming book, like speaking and writing really go hand in hand. Like your book is only your really expensive uh, business card, unless you develop skills to leverage it. And then a huge one of those skills is speaking. And so there's your extra visibility, right? Now we're not even just hiding behind a book. We are like on a stage with a microphone and all eyes are on us. And that can be really intense as an LGBTQ plus person in a lot of different ways. I'll just name a couple. One, during every Q&A, there are straight people in the audience who expect me to answer as if I represent the entire queer community. And that happens for everyone every time we are visible, right? There's, um, there's the trauma dumping that happens, right? After every presentation that I give, there are three or four people that are lined up to tell me a horrific story about when their cousin went through conversion therapy. Like that in and of itself, we have to be there for and we have to have the emotional capacity and bandwidth to deal with. And then you've got the public attacks. Like I know every single time I do a video that does fairly well, that's when the haters come out. And I can't tell you how many times I've been called a pedophile in my neighborhood, let alone online, simply because I am supporting LGBTQ plus youth. So the minute you are a queer person supporting the children of your own community, you are labeled as a pedophile by many people. So here I am a mom of four kids, and that's what my neighbors think of me. Like that is the cost of being visible, whether you've published a book, whether you're speaking or whether you're doing both. Now for the benefits. We need you. I mean, that's what it comes down to. We yeah. need visible people because all of the progress that we've made in the last 150 years, and there's been a lot, let's not ignore that because it's really easy to ignore that. There's been a ton of progress and it's because people have been willing to be visible. People have been willing to take the mic. So is that a whole lot of pressure? Yes. <laughs> and is anyone able to sustain that for their entire life? No, even Brew Paul lives in New Zealand, right? Like there's a reason. So I think that there's a lot of, a lot to gain. And the number one piece of the gaining is the healing that happens when you are able to use your voice. There's yeah. so much healing that's there and healing that you didn't even know you needed. It's a really incredible experience, whether you're using your voice, writing or speaking, and it's being seen and it's being heard. And after those three people that have come to trauma dump on you walk away, it's the three people behind them that have been waiting patiently that have said, I finally feel seen. I've never been to a business conference and felt seen the way you made me feel seen today. Oh my gosh. Like that's priceless. Yeah. That gave me, that gave me goosebumps. And, um, that's what I tell clients, you know, regardless of, of who I'm working with and how they identify, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're human. We're all human. We've all been through some shit and we all want to be seen, heard, valued, understood, right? Like just, just bare, bare bones humanity. <laughs> what I like to call it. Like Legit. that's what we are, what we're looking for. And it's amazing in the process. Of course, for me, I'm not the speaking coach. I'm the, I'm the writing coach. Right. But when they work, when they work on their book, they think when they start the journey, it's about the book and what they don't realize by the time they've done the journey and the book is out there in the world, that it's actually about healing and empowerment of having said the thing that they've kept silent and inside their bodies the entire time. 
And then by the time they realize that, like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. I feel empowered. Or I feel lighter. Or I feel liberated. Or I feel seen and heard because at least I, at least I, you know, at least Allie saw it, you know. Um, but then it gets out into the world and they're like, oh my gosh, they have no idea that yeah. that one person, that person, that person over there, they're, they think that it's, it's going to be a couple of people who care and it ends up being so much more than that. And then they start to get the feedback, you know, that reading your story was like having you in my head, you know, and then they realize that they're not alone and, and that they're onto something. And I just think if every single person was brave enough, and I know bravery with the costs, but brave enough to still do it anyway and say what was on their hearts, then it wouldn't be as nerve wracking because you would know how many other voices were around you saying the same thing, right? Like yeah. when everybody can can step up and all the same thing, but that is where we have to go, right? Where there's privilege enough for every single person, regardless of identity, can stand up without fear and say what needs to be said, right? Like that's the work. That's the work of the world right now. It really is. Like it really is. Places. Yes. And I love that you pointed out like being aware of our privilege. You know, it is it is my job as the immense privilege that I hold as a white, cis, straight passing woman. The privilege that I hold necessitates, requires that I attain those platforms, that I publish that book, that I get on that stage and then I pass off the microphone and I pass off the opportunity. I attain those platforms and then I share that platform with yeah. those that don't hold the same privilege. Like that is the job. And I'm so yeah. glad you brought that up. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a relay race in a way. Um, you know, you're passing off the baton and it's just like, you know, as we need men to be there in the women's movement to help get women where they need to be, <laughs> women need to be there for other women who don't look like them and who are behind them for whatever reason, right? It's it's everybody looking out for the person who's behind, helping them up the mountain, right? Until everybody reaches the summit and then finally we can get our shit together and we can just be all on the summit together, like watching the sunset and being happy and peaceful and like in a collective that we're supposed to be in. That's my big dream. <laughs> Allie's got the utopia all planned out, y'all. <laughs> I want it so bad. Um, and I think, you know, too, uh, I posted about this recently on LinkedIn. You know, I think it's also owning our mistakes and owning and owning our privilege and recognizing when our privilege shows up and gets in the way. Mm. Um, and we all have it. We all have privilege to some extent somewhere that's different than somebody else's. Um, and, you know, recognizing that being so conscious of that in how you show up with others and then owning it when you mess it up, because that really is the way forward, right? Like that growth, learning, education. I have to imagine, Elena, that you've, you've really seen growth and learning when you're doing your <laughs> consulting work and you're going inside these businesses and these people, you're teaching these people language and things that they've never had to consider. They're like on a new frontier. Um, I mean, talk to us a little bit about that. Like just. Oh, absolutely. Like, let's talk about just gender identity alone. Uh, flying back from Boston. I just spoke at inbound. I'm flying back. The guy in the seat next to me, it was a direct flight. It was a five and a half hour flight. You get real close with their seat companion at that point. And random, very typical dude, right? Like dad, married, white, cis, the beard, the whole thing, two kids, right? The whole dad thing. Bod. And to have that conversation with him and for him within 15 minutes of realizing like, I'm a safe person. I can answer questions without getting like defensive. You know what I mean? Within 15 minutes, we were probably flying still over Massachusetts when he was like, okay, so what is cis and can I say trans? Right. He was very confused and he needed a safe person to ask. And, you know, when you're, when you're like just surrounded by the world, it's very easy to think everyone understands gender identity. And then to realize like, no, the very typical dude does not. And so when we can develop really easy ways to explain that. So I develop, I have a very easy way of explaining, right? Like 
if we're going to define gender as far as chromosomes, then it's very much not binary. There's 72 different combinations. You could be XXY for all you know, right? So that concept that you can explain in 45 seconds is often like mind blowing for people and really helps them understand like, oh, this is a we situation. This is not a them situation. He had never heard the term intersex. He had no idea what that was. He didn't realize that when an athlete is, uh, is on estrogen, that their testosterone level is incredibly low. They have decreased lung capacity. They have decreased muscle mass. The NCAA highly regulates that, right? Like there's all of these talking points that the average human has in their head all the time. And when they find someone who it's is safe enough to ask, is it true? Then that's when incredible change can happen. So yeah, it can be, it can be really fun <laughs> to blow people's minds. <laughs> and I think that it comes down to like openness and curiosity, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than rage, um, you know, ego, um, no, and the majority of people are curious and not rageful. Like that's the cool thing, but that's also the thing that's really hard to remember because we don't hear from them as often. So the right. minute you start feeling like the majority of America doesn't understand gender identity, like get off social media and start interacting with people in real life. Cause even where I live, people are not as rage filled as it feels like they are online. Yeah. And of course, of course it feels like that, right? Because as we know about cyberbullying and digital harassment and all of the things that are happening on our online platforms, it's really easy to say stuff, intense, horrific, hateful things and feel safe doing it because we don't have to look the person in the eye. We don't have to associate them as a human. Like we can, we can drop our comment and we can walk away and it doesn't matter what our words, you know, how our words land. Um, and when you're in person, it's it's different, like, because you're seeing each other's humanity. Um, and I'm so glad to know from your perspective that the world is more curious than rageful. Um, maybe it's just where I live. I don't know. <laughs> but like, there are, I'm like, oh man, I would love to have that conversation if people could keep their cool. Like, if people could remain yeah. open and curious and having like a respectful dialogue about like, what do you think? And why do you think that? And how, mm -hmm. what is that based on? Right. And, but, mm -hmm. but this is what I think, and this is what I've heard. And this is what I know. Let's like come together on this and like figure out like what's actually accurate. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and sometimes it's a matter of perhaps religious belief and other times it's like, no, we've got science. We have actual science that has studied X, Y, or Z and knows how these things work, or we have policy that suggests, you know, whatever it is, like in the example of how heavily regulated the estrogen is, um, there's just so many things that are known, but I think when we're just getting our information online from, you know, unreputable sources, our family, our friends who have one opinion, and we're just like, you know, drinking whatever they're putting out, um, you know, that's where we get into trouble. And like, that's not gonna, that's not gonna get us where we need to go so that everybody can feel safe in this world. Um, so Elena, we could, we could just sit I know. Everything forever. Um, what about, uh, let's just wrap up with one more question. Um, all right. So you mentioned that a ridiculous percentage of authors are um, heteronormative. Um, and so we have a very small uh, canon, you know, of voices that are diversified or that are coming from our LGBTQIA community. How can, um, how can those who hold the privilege help widen the spectrum so that we don't have such a ridiculous percentage of one and nobody else being represented from the other. Fund the damn books. <laughs> fund the damn books. All right. Tell us, tell us more about that. How should Let we me get specific. So not only do we need their voice, like that's a given, right? But let's take it a step further is that that author, that queer author needs that byline, right? For them to be able to be a published author, lends so much credence to everything else they do. It means they can increase their speaking fees or their teaching fees or whatever it is that they do, it creates more social proof as to the validity of their work. If we can get them published, right? And then it just pay, plays out in spades from there. So 
we, for example, we have two authors right now. We have Pride and Joy Publishing. We only pu publish queer authors of nonfiction. We have two authors who have a book that we would love to publish. One is a queer, incredible person who wrote their master's thesis on how do you create an anti-racist career center at a college or university. Wow. We need that book. It has nothing to do with LGBTQ plus issues. They happen to be a queer author, but their studies have proven that that system works. The world needs that book. It's going to cost between six and 7,000 for us to get all the editing done, the layout done, the front cover done, the ISBN, right? Like that's the cost of doing a real published book, right? Between six and 7,000 right now. Who knows where it's going to be next year? And that is the only damn thing standing in the way of that book reaching Barnes and Noble or Target or Amazon or anywhere else, right? There's another one that is, it is more memoir focused, but it is around a Jewish person's experience with transitioning and how that interplayed with both their faith and their culture. We need that book. We yeah. need that book. And that author needs that byline. Again, the only thing standing in the damn way is the capital. So whether it is supporting an author with those publication fees, whether it is buying ownership in a publishing company like Row House, they're an incredible publication company that's publicly owned and you can invest in it. And they use that capital to publish those books. Like there's so many ways to go about it, but it fu fundamentally comes down to please allies, please fund the damn book. Yeah. Love yeah. it. All right. Fund the damn book. That's a <laughs> mic drop moment from Elena Joy Thurston here. Elena, where should people connect with you? And is there anything that you specifically want people to know that is up and coming that you are mm. uh, connected to? Yeah, Outright Authors, it's only offered once a year. It's only offered once a year. We right now have eight different applicants who would appreciate scholarships. Uh, they can't access the course otherwise. So there's that. If you are not a queer author of nonfiction, but really want to see that happen, we do accept donations in order to cover a scholarship for them. We've been able, because of an incredible donor, we've been able to offer partial scholarships to everyone who needs one. Um, but also, it's just an incredible way to get a huge head start on your book. So I am in the class. I took the class last time and it helped me so much, mostly to realize I don't want to write the, the memoir right now. So was that a waste of time? 100% no, because I thought that that had to be my next step. And once I was able to release that judgment, it was so good. And now I'm reading my, I'm writing my inclusive leadership book with Suzette, who's running the class. There's no way I could run a nonprofit and my business and write the damn book without the structure that Suzette has created. So yes, please join us. I think the biggest part is y'all meeting every week with a group of only LGBTQ plus authors is a amazing experience. The community that came from the last one, we are all still so, so tight. Like it is in a soul filling experience. And I hope everyone who wants to gets to experience it. It's amazing. I mean, especially because like writing a book really should not be done in isolation. Yes. Um, and so if you can work on a book, not just with like people that you like, but people who could like 100% get your experience because they've been there and they've gone through some of those same complexities. Um, like why? Like, oh my God, it's just awesome. It's just, just so awesome. Um, and Suzette's wonderful. And for folks who are, who are watching this conversation with Elena, Suzette's also been on open book broadcast. So you should head over to the YouTube page at the right place, right time.com. Look at the open book broadcast playlist, um, and go watch the conversation with Suzette. Suzette has another fabulous story, um, yeah. and does some really beautiful things in the world. And she's got a dynamite book that is coming out. I've already pre-ordered it. I can't wait. <laughs> to, to to read it and it has a fabulous title um and so you should definitely you want to know who suzette is as much as you want to know who lena is in this world and what they're doing to help um queer authors lena it's been a pleasure and a joy having you with me today um thank you so very much and folks we'll be back again with another episode of open book broadcast next month 
Um, for now, drop into the comments um, any of your takeaways or aha moments. We hope that you enjoyed this episode and we will see you again soon. Bye now.